So this is a uh, um, so this is where you can now just open uh, shockwave flash files. So when I go to file, this is where I had opened it before. I can do file open, browse, okay, okay. Then this is the simulation, and that's uh, um, what you are supposed to have access to. And if you don't have access to this simulation, then um, then um, you won't be able to do the lab. So if you're watching this recording and you had trouble getting this far, message me, let me know so that I can help you troubleshoot. Um, and uh, I guess, um, yeah. So if you're not able to get this far, let me know, we'll work something out. So now for the rest of this session, I'm assuming you got this far. And let me just try to follow the, some of the activities in this virtual lab. And I won't go through all the steps in detail because that's the um, inquiry process that you are supposed to be following. I'm not gonna do all that for you. Uh, let me just uh, highlight some things that I want you to uh, not skip out on. <laughs> um, so yeah, so. Any questions as we move on? I'm, I'm going to take silence and lack of any chat messages as there being no questions. If you have questions at any time, put it into chat window so that I'll know to address it. Um, so the virtual lab, it comes in two, two parts, two parts and three experiments. Part A is uh, 1D collisions. It uses this tab, introduction tab. And uh, once you feel somewhat comfortable with this, then um, then you know then you should do uh, part to be 2D collisions. So in this uh, first part is where I'm hoping to develop some some of your intuition about collisions. And um, so I so this is was what I was trying to do with the new style labs. I pose a research question. And this is really your guiding question. Your goal isn't so much to answer it right away, because um, if you're just trying to answer this right away, then you will just scratch the surface, you will give me something shallow, and I won't be satisfied. Um, but that, this question is what I want you to keep in your mind. How do masses of colliding balls determine the outcome of an elastic head-on collision? It's one, one question I want you to keep in mind. And research question two, um, what is the effect of inelasticity in collision? And I'm not even expecting an answer right now. Like if you were to just give immediate answer, you'd say, oh, kinetic energy is not conserved. And that's just such a shallow answer that if I wanted that answer, we didn't need to, to go through the whole song and dance of doing the lab. So you have access to this simulation so that you can explore these situations in a fairly open-ended way. And these are really your guiding questions. Um, and I guess once you have these questions, then you can kind of do um, exploration on your own. I mean, I have a simulation and it says, how do masses of colliding balls determine the outcome of an elastic head-on collision? I can just do that. I can say, oh, they collide and they bounce. All right, there's one. And all right, let's just change the mass, see what it does. I can definitely do that. And huh, uh, that doesn't bounce back now. And if I now make this head more massive, then now it does that. And uh, you can just uh, basically play with it. You can explore on your own and can, uh, that's definitely a possibility. But I guess, um, I don't know how many here have played Minecraft. Uh, when you have a wide open system, sometimes that wide open, kind of limitless possibility that can be a bit of, um, that can be paralyzing <laughs> because you can do everything. <laughs> you don't know what to do. Uh, so that's really what the instructions are for. Um, so that you have some guidance there. So it says the initial settings, uh, let me just reset everything, reset all. And uh, should we set up a screenshot on the right? Um, first of all, what happens? Uh, that's actually basically what I did. Uh, that's my step one. Uh, does the simulation seem realistic? Um, hopefully it seemed realistic. Uh, maybe if it doesn't make the simulation go faster. 
don't know if that makes it seem any more realistic. I don't know. Um, okay, and uh, so here I, you know, so this is the instruction that I might have been giving in class for, I, I don't know. This is a virtual lab, so let me stop comparing it to face-to-face -to -face physical lab. Uh, the, let's see. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm describing in this step number two is actually the second thing that I did because I kind of remember my instructions. This is what I want you to try and see so that um, you can see how qualitatively different this uh, version of simulation with a different uh, set of parameters is from this simulation with uh, different parameters. They are not just quantitatively different. They are different in the set of numbers you get, but they are so qualitatively different in that without using any numbers, you can describe how those two uh, outcomes were different. And uh, for the second scenario, yeah, I think uh, um, I had, I didn't increase it as much last time, but 1.5, that's um, what I had there. And, um, yeah, and once you have this, then um, yeah, yeah. And so I guess that this is where I wish we weren't just to push into this situation with no preparation. But what I want to encourage you to try to do is um, when you're doing this on your own, like this little few paragraphs here, is where it should take a fair amount of time kind of playing with the things and uh, uh, playing with the things that um, surprises you, kind of uh, follow down the path that seemed unintuitive and um, kind of see that. And here's one thing I can kind of show you. Uh, one thing that when I was playing that I, because I kind of forgot some of the things I did before, one thing that surprised me was just uh, running this simulation just how quickly that number two ball is moving. Because, um, so, so, you know, we said all, when I had this original situation, this is kind of how they move, kind of slow. All right, Sim didn't seem all that surprising. And when they had the same mass, then, uh, then this uh, had the same speed as before. All right, not all that surprising. And what was now suddenly, uh, and you know, when I had this, uh, uh, just uh, uh, double the mass, then I got this before, and uh, maybe that should have been a bit surprising. And what was more striking was that when this was three times the mass, then this number two ball was suddenly now moving much faster than if this ball was initially moving. Then this could be a beginning point of an investigation. Um, you might wonder, you know, does this mean uh, what if, if I make this ball lighter? Would that mean it would uh, move much more quickly? Or is there some limit to how quickly, how fast it might be moving? And that kind of investigation, you know, it, it you should take time. So I'm pr trying out this, some of these scenarios so that you can see it, so that you will at least think to try it. And, um, and in investigating this, is what I am hoping you will do some of this because uh, I think you will be able to kind of capture the outlines of this uh, of physical setup, how uh, there's some limit to how fast the, this number two ball is moving. And um, if you are working it out uh, mathematically, that's actually a bit of an algebra exercise. <laughs> that's why you have access to the simulation. And um, yeah, so. By the way, I think uh, uh, I'll mention this a little bit more. There are some parameters here which you might help you uh, explore this, uh, like showing values. That'll help you um, kind of measure values if you're trying to compare it to some calculation. So um, you should play out, play with these the different parameters, um, you know, see what that works like. So that's the first experiment. And you know, you should spend some time investigating. And in the experiment two is the inelastic collision where the energy isn't conserved. And um, 
you should go through the instructions here and you will kind of see what you will see as you reduce elasticity. And just a couple of things I want you to show just so that you have some reference as you are trying uh, following these instructions and um, I shouldn't say following instructions. As you are taking this guidance to um, explore this setup, um, you will see that when elastic, elasticity is 50%, that actually doesn't mean that kinetic energy goes down to 50% after collision. 50% of 0 0.25, uh, let me actually change the numbers so that, um, so that it's an easy round number. Ooh. Okay, 0.4. So when they collide, 0.25, that's not 50% of 0.4. That's I don't know what the number is. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do this math in my head. It's, it's more than 50%. And in fact, what you will see is that when you make elasticity zero uh, for this exact setup, you will get 50% uh, of initial kinetic energy after collision. And uh, this actually depends on some like details of the setup. If the mass two is bigger, then you won't get 50%. It'll get something different. And this exploration is what I want you to do here. There's some guidance here that will kind of help you at least to see some beginnings of something that you can investigate further and kind of um, um, investigate for yourself. <laughs> and um, yeah. Um, so, you know, this uh, uh, experiment two relates to research question two. You know, what is the effect of inelasticity? And, um, and what remaining considerations, and this is kind of what I was demonstrating, limit the possible outcomes of completely inelastic collision. So this is an example of completely inelastic collision. And it doesn't mean that all the kinetic energy goes away here, goes down to 50%. Here, um, the kinetic energy is a bit different. Yeah, so for part A, um, as you're going through those two experiments, hopefully you can kind of fig find out for yourself what the outlines of um, what these questions are getting at is. So once you've done that with the 1D collisions, one thing I wanted to demonstrate is uh, some techniques for making some measurements that you can't make within this simulation. And that comes up with the 2D collisions. Um, so, you know, with the 2D collisions, you're using this advanced tab so that you can do 2D collisions. It's a lot of fun. Um, let me just show you what um, in graphical, in, you know, graphics, uh, what these uh, two scenarios will be. But, you know, you don't, you shouldn't be limited with these two scenarios. I'm just giving those as an example of where you can see something interesting. Billiard ball collision, let me set it up here. I kind of remember what, how it should be set up. For billiard ball collisions, these two things should have the same mass. Um, ball number two should have zero velocity. So that's what it has. I think if it has a values, yeah, it's kind of easier. Um, and ball number one, I mean, it could go straight head on, but it's a little bit more interesting if it's not going straight head on. Um, so if it's a billiard, it should be 100% elastic. And um, what the simulation would look like is something like this. And there are some features you can turn on which will help you investigate this setup. Um, you can turn on, oh, you can turn off reflecting border. So there's none of that annoying reflection if you don't like a reflection. And you can show path so that you can track where the balls have been. And once you start turning on path, then you might notice some of the features you will see, um, which um, I think I kind of want you to figure that out for yourself. So, um, so I think, yeah, you should uh, see peculiar feature remaining the same. Yeah, so I'll just uh, change this slightly so that you can maybe have a more chance to see that peculiar feature and then I'll leave that for you. Um, <clears throat> so that's the billiard ball collision. Um, let me see, uh, motion of center of mass. I guess with the, yeah, with the border turned off, I think it's a lot easier to see. Um, you can kind of, as the simulation runs, 
you can see the motion of center of mass. Maybe it's actually easier with uh, border turned on, reflecting border. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see what affects motion of center of mass and what doesn't. I don't know. It might take a bit of time for. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so when they so um, so, but those are the two scenarios I'm pointing out. But the um, main, um, I think I ask you that uh, research question, uh, which is um, investigate features of collision occurring in two D dimensions. That's really the um, biggest thing, and I give you some things that you might consider, but you shouldn't feel limited by this. Because uh, um, basically having two dimensional, uh, you know, one additional dimension of freedom opens some more possibilities to um, interesting things happening. So you should uh, make a use of that. Um, now, what I want you to show is, I think I give you one specific task, which is this measurement and calculation. So for one elastic collision, measure the momentum of colliding balls before and after the collision, verify through calculation that its momentum and kinetic energy is conserved. So, and so all, most of the measurements you can do fairly well within the program, especially if you turn on show values, then you can see, um, you can see the masses and you can see the speed. Although you can use this value, I think I would recommend that you don't use that, but calculate it for yourself because I think it has some limited significant figures. 0 0.5 times 1.88, ah, never mind. Yeah, but uh, I mean, you know, if this is a little bit different, then you can see that 0 0.4 times 1.92, 0 0.768, it's rounding to 0 0.77. Whatever, but when you have show values, it shows you the magnitudes of speed and momentum, and um, that'll make it relatively easy to measure the magnitudes. What the program doesn't really let you measure are the angles. So that's what I want you to demonstrate, how to measure angles. So, um, so I think I give you some guidance in the write-up. Uh, it says, you know, if you have also values, you may need to, yeah. So, I mean, you can, so if we were doing this in class, I would have given you protractor, but you might not have protractor at home. Then what you should do is uh, use this uh, software. And uh, I think I gave you two free software that you might consider. GIMP is what I'm going to demonstrate in this session. It's a free software, uh, what's actually called a free and open source. You can download it for free and install it. It's already installed on my computer because I use it all the time. If you see this icon in virtual class session, well, that's what that icon is, it's GIMP. So um, I think I recommend the GIMP because it has some features that will be useful. So within my computer, I can actually take a screenshot using Windows feature of a screen snip. Um, that's one thing I can do, but um, but depending on the software you are using, you might not have that. And uh, depending on software you are using, you might be able to use the print screen button. So this is how it works on my computer. Um, if I do, so I'm pressing the keyboard button called the print screen or PRTSC. When I do that, it copies the content of my screen to the clipboard. So when I do, uh, file, create from clipboard, it pastes uh, um, everything here. So, and then I can, you know, select a rectangle and um, image, crop to selection, crop down and do that. Um, now, if somehow it's not easy to take a screenshot on your own computer, I think uh, GIMP gives you an option to do that. You can create and you can take a screenshot. Yeah, so grab a whole screen. After let's say two seconds delay, that'll give me time to minimize this GIMP window. So I do grab, minimize, and it'll grab the screen there. And now I can work with that. So, so let me do that. Um, so I'm gonna let this simulation run. 
uh, there it is. Um, so let me take another screenshot with the GIMP. File, create, screenshot, grab the whole screen after two seconds delay. Okay, there it is. So um, with this image taken, now I can make the angle measurement using the tools within GIMP. Let me just demonstrate that. Oh, um, um, sorry, I'm using shortcut. <laughs> Let me just tell you what shortcuts I'm using. Um, I'm typing in Alt I, that's why the menu item is opening. And then I'm typing in C, that's the crop to selection shortcut. <laughs> and to zoom in, um, I'm typing in Shift and plus key. That's the shortcut for zooming GIMP. And um, so that's where I am. And I was playing with this in preparation of this setup, this measure tool. Um, you can do Shift to M to shift to that tool or you can just click on it. That measure tool will let me measure things. So let me click on this point here to start a point where I'm measuring stuff. I can measure the distance and I can measure the angle. And you will see it at the bottom of the window, it's kind of not all that noticeable. So uh, let me do this. I'm going to put this in a place here where I, it's, the line is as aligned to that blue line as possible. And my main goal here is to measure line. And uh, I was researching accessibility tool in Windows. So if I press Windows and I think a plus, that'll bring up, uh, yeah, my magnifying tool. So where you see that measure, so this is how I set up to measure the angle. And where you see that information is way down here at the bottom of the GIMP screen. Um, here is where it's measuring it. So the pixels, I'm gonna ignore it because I don't care about distance. Uh, but the angle I'm measuring here is 70.09 degree as marked here. So that's a 75.09 degree. So I can measure it that way. And I guess for this particular, and by the way, to get rid of this, I press uh, Windows and Escape. And you know, your operating system might have something similar, but if it's your own screen, you can kind of look. So, um, in, and here, it looks like I probably also need to measure the initial angle because the initial uh, momentum is not at zero degrees. It's at some angle. So, um, so having done that, it looks like it's about uh, 5.33 degrees. So I need to do that. Um, and finally, one of the, um, the third angle I need to measure here would be uh, angle of the second arc going both. So starting from here, and you, you will see, uh, well, I don't, let me zoom in, <laughs> move this here. By the way, I'm zooming here with a mouse scroll thing um, or pinch action, whatever. Um, okay, so here, um, so that's the horizontal. So from that horizontal, I'm measuring that angle. Um, so uh, windows plus for zoom. So for that angle that it's showing there, it's uh, being measured here, 15.04 degrees. And uh, when you're doing calculations, you do have to be mindful, you know, is it going in a positive X or is it going in, um, you know, I guess uh, counterclockwise from positive X, which would, we measure as positive angle in most uh, uh, axis or uh, clockwise from positive X, which most of the time we measure that as uh, negative angle. So you would have to be mindful of that when you are carrying out the calculations that are being instructed here to um, see if uh, momentum is conserved. It's a vector quantity. You have to break it down into components and do that. So, so yeah, this is the one uh, kind of concrete task I'm asking you to do. And as you're doing that, um, I, I don't know, I help uh, you get curious about some things and you investigate that on your own. And when you find something interesting that you included in the lab narrative, this is open-ended and I understand that people don't like, sometimes people don't like open-ended things because you know, too many possibilities, like what could you be missing? And, um, and um, what I will say is this, um, 
think if you go to this, so this is my grading rubric. Uh, this is the actual grading rubric. It's two, uh, it you know, comes into parts, completeness and comprehension. And really completeness means um, uh, in the, from what I see in the lab narrative, there are evidences of all the uh, things that you should have uh, kind of at least looked at or looked at. Um, so it's on two point scale, two, one, or zero. Most people won't get zero. <laughs> You'll get at least one. And as I was saying earlier, um, I think with these lab narratives, I'll give people a second chance to turn in a corrected lab narrative. So when I give you an initial grading, you can kind of look at my feedback, redo some things, and uh, turn in the second time, and I'll um, reconsider things. Um, so completeness, that's one. Comprehension. It's uh, um, kind of, I guess it's based mostly on did you make mistakes? <laughs> like here, you know, I'm asking you to do verify through calculation that it's conserved. If you're making a bunch of calculation mistakes, then that indicates lack of comprehension and that'll show. And by the way, here, one point is not there on purpose. It, because it's because I don't plan on giving one out of three. It's basically going to be two or three out of three. Um, so this is my rubric, and uh, it's uh, the nature of these new style labs being open-ended means that there will be many different ways a lab narrative can be written. And really, my direction to you is um, be creative. You know, it's well. Where is it? I don't know. Well, do I put it somewhere? Um. Well, I, let me see if I say creative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think of basically what I'm getting at is um, the, um, so what remains the same in all the lib activities are my expectations, which is that I'm hoping you do learn some uh, creative problem solving in physics, and in this case, physics labs. and. Um, you know, the circumstance in which we are doing this is not ideal. Um, <laughs> this is something that I would have done a, like a year from now when I'm teaching physics 4A again. Um, <laughs> I'm not really ready this semester, so we'll make the best of it. But really, my advice to you is um, this uh, simulation gives you um, access to some things that uh, gives you ability to do things that are kind of really cumbersome to do by uh, algebra and by road calculation. And I, my advice is to make use of that, make the best of it. Um, we'll kind of, this is journey we are taking together. We'll see how this goes. <laughs>